Amen. Second Kings chapter 5, verses 5 through 15. We stand this afternoon in honor of the reading of God's Word. Talking today, the anticipation is killing me. Amen. The anticipation is killing me. 2 Kings 5, 5 through 15, and the word of God today reads, And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant unto thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he ripped his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and stood at the, do at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, meaning angry, and went away and said, Behold, I thought, he will surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farfar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Amen. The anticipation is killing me. Second Kings 5, 5 through 15. You bow your heads with me a moment again. Father, we once again thank you, God, for the house of the Lord and the opportunity to come in to this place to lift up your name in song and to exalt your word through the preaching master today. There are many preachers who think a great deal of themselves, and it is my desire, O oh God, to be humble before you and to acknowledge that if it is not for the anointing, I can offer the people of God nothing. I need the Holy Ghost to empower me at this hour. I need the Spirit of the Lord to quicken my thought process, to quicken my spirit, to quicken my tongue, that I might speak, thus saith the Lord, unto the people of God. 
that they might be nourished, encouraged, lifted up by your word, that their faith might grow to a greater depth in you than they've ever before known. Master, we need the anointing to touch not only the speaker, but we need the anointing to touch the hearer. Let everyone today under the sound of my voice receive the word of God. Let them receive today that which the Spirit of God would speak unto the church. For we ask it in that precious, sacred name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. This story is talking about a man by the name of Naaman, and Naaman is sent by the king of Syria, whom he served in the armed forces. And he is sent by the king of Syria at the bidding of one of his wife's hand servants, maid servants, who happened to be a young Jewish girl. You see, Naaman was a good man, and he was high up in the ranks of the armies of Syria. Second uh, Kings 5 and 1 tells us, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. You know, leprosy in the word of God is representative of sin. So what we're reading in this story in a symbolic sense is Naaman was a great man. Naaman was a strong man. Naaman had all kinds of achievements and all kinds of connections. And he had really established himself in the kingdom of Syria. But for all that, Naaman was still a sinner. I'm going to tell you something today. I don't care how big shot you think you are in the church. I don't care how holy and how righteous and how godly you think yourself to be. When it's all said and done, you're still a sinner. Hello now. You've still got that leprosy in your life. You've still got that sin in your life. You see, God is not impressed by the things that impress men. And men are seldom impressed by the things that impress God. <laughs> mm -hmm. My Lord have mercy. So Naaman was sent by the king of Syria to Israel because this young Jewish girl had recommended that Naaman go to the prophet in Israel that it was there that he could be healed of his leprosy. Well, Naaman didn't know exactly where to go, so he went to the king of Syria, and the king of Syria said, let me give you some gifts to give to the king of Israel, and you go to him because he'll know everybody. He'll have all the connections, and you talk to him and see what can be done. So Naaman shows up at the palace in Israel with all these gifts, and he says, I have leprosy, and I've been told that in Israel I can be cured of this leprosy. So if you'd be so kind, would you cure me? Well, the king of Israel was smarter than most doctors today because the king of Israel, for all his power and all his influence and all his authority and all his wealth, he knew he wasn't God. And he said, am I God to cure a leper? <laughs> so who do you think I am that you come to me and ask for a cure of your leprosy? Am I God? Is, is this within my capability? And the Bible said he ripped his clothes. I mean, he was really frustrated by this. <laughs> He's like, what is the king of Syria? Is he trying to start a war with me? Is he trying to get something going with me? Did he send this man here as some sort of a joke or as some sort of an instigation to war? And the prophet heard he must have been pretty close. 
He heard, oh boy, the king's having himself a fit up in the throne room. This fella come from Syria looking for healing for his leprosy. And he went to the king and the king said, have I got it? And the prophet said, oh, 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 well, hey, go tell the king, send him my way. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, I remember as a kid in church, in the Pentecostal church, when people had illness and people had sickness and people had disease and everything seemed hopeless and it didn't look like the doctors were going to be able to do a thing for them, we would say, oh, hey, I know where you can get some help. Come down this way. Hallelujah. We've got a church of praying people that know how to touch God. We've got people of faith in our church who know how to believe God for miracles. If you need what you need, you don't. You may not get it at the doctor's office. You may not get it at the hospital, but you can get it over here at our church. And they'd come, and by God, they'd get it. I saw more miracles probably by the time I was 10 than most people have seen in a lifetime. I've seen God heal brain tumors. I've seen people go back to the doctor and find out that a tumor that was killing them had disappeared. It was no longer there. The doctors couldn't figure out what happened. They said there is not even any indication of scar tissue, which would indicate it was once there. And the brain tumor just dissolved and went away. And this all happened not in a matter of months. This literally happened in a matter of days. They had just seen the doctor a week before. I know one young man who was going in for surgery to have a brain tumor removed. And he had gone in and uh, had, you know, all the tests done because for brain surgery they have to really be specific about where the tumor is located and all that and what it's connected to and all that sort of thing. And they brought him in and there were a couple of pre-surgery procedures they had to do to get him ready for the surgery. And we had anointed him with oil and prayed for him in my children's church. At that little Pentecostal church I grew up in in southern New England. We kids prayed for one of our own in children's church. I was about 12 or 13 years old at the time. And we anointed him with oil and prayed for him. Because our children's church, what we did in children's church is we acted like we were having church like the folks upstairs in adult church were having. We had our chairs set up like a sanctuary. We conducted our own little service. We, everything they did up there, we did down here. This boy was sick and needed a healing, so we anointed him with oil and we laid hands on him and prayed for him. When he went in for his pre-operation procedures, guess what? The tumor was gone. Couldn't find it anywhere. Had no clue where it had gone to. He didn't wind up needing the surgery at all. See, there is help. You just got to know the right place to go. You just got to understand it's not about politics. It's not about FEMA. It's not about doctors. It's not about scientists. No, there is a God in Israel. Hallelujah. There is a God in Israel. There is a God today who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we might ask or think. So Naaman goes to the home of the prophet and one of the prophet's servants comes down to the door and said, well, I've got a message from the prophet for you. Go to the Jordan River here in Israel. Now, for those of you that don't know, the Jordan River is an extremely filthy river. It is a very silty river. It gets a lot of runoff from the nearby mountains, and it is full of dirt and soot. It is one of the dirtiest. It's known to be one of the dirtiest rivers in Israel. It doesn't run with crystal clear water. You know how sometimes you go to certain places, and the river just looks brown and kind of yucky, you know? That's what the Jordan River looks like. It wasn't the kind of river like the Banana River over there in Florida that just runs so pretty with you know, nice, clear, blue water. No, it's a, a silty, uh, dirty river. It just runs brown and ugly. And the servant of 
Isaiah says to him, Go down to the Jordan River and dip seven times. Boy, I'm going to tell you, most people wouldn't hardly want to dip one time mm -hmm. in that old dirty river. But you tell him he's got to dip seven times. Seven times? Oh, Naaman was mad as a hornet. He got so angry. He said, I came here with great anticipation. But what I anticipated it was that the prophet would come down himself that he would pray some big prayer over me and he'd smite my arm with his hand and the leprosy would be gone. That is what I anticipated. See, that's the way I had it envisioned it would happen in my mind. I'm going to tell you more people lose their miracle more people fail to receive their healing. More people fail to receive from God that which they need because they built up a certain anticipation in their mind. They anticipate how God is going to do the work. They anticipate. Let me tell you something about God. Honey, you can never be one step ahead of God. You'll never be able to know what God's going to do, how God's going to do it, or who God's trying to talk to in your trial. You see, you may have to go through what you're going through because there's a doctor somewhere in the process who needs Jesus. Mm -hmm. You may have to go through months of chemotherapy, you may have to go through months of radiation, you may have to go through months of pain and agony, you may have to go like uh, Paul and Silas did, they were beaten and they were cast in prison for casting a demon out of a woman. See, Christians aren't guaranteed a good life. We're not guaranteed everything's going to go perfectly well and we're not ever going to have hard times and we're not ever going to have to go through trials and we're not ever going to have struggles and we're not ever going to experience sickness and let me tell you those false preachers out there in the world today who tell you that uh, there's such a thing as what they refer to as divine health if you're walking in the will of God if you're doing things the way you ought to be doing it you'll be perfectly healthy and you won't be sick now the Bible said that it is the will of God that we prosper and that we walk in good health even as our soul prospers so it's God's will that you be healthy that's one reason why when you're sick, you can go to God in prayer and you can believe that he's going to heal you because it's his will to heal. Do you hear what I'm telling you? It's his will for you to be well. That's what the word of God tells us. So we're not guessing at that. The, the, the scripture tells us plainly that it is God's will that we prosper and walk in good health. Do you follow what I'm telling you? So if we know that's the will of God, then we don't have to worry when we go to God and ask for healing whether or not it's the will of God to heal. Sure it is. But what we have to be concerned about is how we anticipate that healing will come. If you anticipate it's going to be instant, and it doesn't come instantly, and you leave like Naaman did, just mad as a hornet. Well, I thought God was going to heal me instantly. I thought the Lord was going to heal me the minute the preacher laid hands on me. And bless God, I'm still going to the doctor, and he still says I'm sick. And he still says I've got this cancer, and he still says I've got this sickness in my body. Well, the Lord didn't heal me. And you know how many people lose out, Johnny, on a miracle because they anticipate God's going to do it one way instead of letting God be God. Let God do it in His time. Let God do it in His way. 
You don't know what God's trying to do. You don't know the bigger plan. You don't know the bigger outlook. You don't know what all irons God has in the fire. We are all chess pieces on the game board of life and God has to use his people to reach the lost and to reach the dying and to reach those who are unsaved. And sometimes God's got to put a piece in a place where we might not rather be. But we need to be there for a minute. Paul and Silas were beaten bloody. They were put in the deepest prison. They were charged. The guard, the Roman guard was charged with his life to keep them safely locked up. The Bible said about midnight, Paul and Silas began to sing and pray and praise God. My goodness. Darkest hour of the night and these stupid, foolish, Pentecostal, Holy Ghost-filled Christians, what are they going to do? Are they going to start bawling and squalling? Are they going to start writing letters to their fellow church members? Please get a picket going. Please get out in front of the jail and start picketing and let's see if we can get the Romans to let us out of jail. No. They begin to sing and they begin to worship God even in that hour. And the power of God fell. And the prison was shaken. And it was shaken. An earthquake shook that old jail so severely that every door in the prison opened. Not just Paul and Silas's. All of the doors opened. And all of the prisoners, the Bible said, heard Paul and Silas singing and worshiping God. They knew what brought that earthquake on. They knew what brought the power of God down. They heard Paul and Silas singing in that whole dungeon. They heard it. And all of a sudden they felt the power of God shake that place. And the Bible tells us that the shackles about their hands and feet literally just fell off. The jailer woke up with a shaking and he thought, oh dear God, everybody's escaped because you know everybody else in that jailhouse. The minute their door opened, they were out like a flash. But he was charged with his life with these two men, Paul and Silas. If those two men got out, he was as good as dead. And the word of God said he drew his sword and he was ready to kill himself because he knew if he didn't, he was in for a painful death. He just assumed that Paul and Silas had left like everybody else. But all of a sudden he heard a voice from the deepest prison cry out, Do thyself no harm! We're here! What? And he run into that prison cell and there's Paul and Silas. Their chains are off. They could have left any time. I'll tell you something. A lot of times God could give you a miracle any time. God could set you free any time. You'd be free to go any time. But if you'll be open to letting God use you, if you'll be open to letting God work His plan, even when you could be out, you'll stay in it a while. You see, that jailer needed to know Jesus. That jailer needed to hear the gospel. That jailer was the first major... Uh, uh, Gentile figure to hear the gospel. And Paul and Silas went to that jailer's home and preached the gospel to them, to the entire household. And they all believed and they all were baptized. An entire army of a Roman soldier was brought into the church of the living God because Paul and Silas had to go through the prison experience. See, you don't know what God's trying to do through your pain. You don't know what God's trying to do through your sickness. You don't know what God's trying to do through your struggle and through your trial. There may be somebody he's trying to reach. There may be somebody that won't believe on him until they see a full-blown miracle with their own eyes. And in order for him to get that miracle in front of them, you've got to go to your deathbed like I did in 2000. Maybe I had to go to my deathbed because one of those nurses or one of those doctors 
in that hospital, Yale New Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. Maybe one of those doctors desperately needed to see that God is God. And the only way, Tommy, they'd ever see it, because they weren't going to walk into a church. They weren't going to believe somebody telling them with their lips about a miracle they had experienced. No, they had to see it with their own eyes. I told you there was a young psychiatric student at Yale, they had people before I was in. I was in three times that summer before I went in and was there for two months. And a young psychiatric student was part of a group of students that uh, Yale is a teaching hospital, of course, part of Yale University. And they were going room to room and they were talking to different patients and they came into my room and the instructor, the doctor who was teaching this group of about eight students, you know, he said to me, he said, well, Mr. Morrow, are you aware that you may die? And I said, yep. And he said, well, how do you feel about that? <laughs> and I kind of smiled. I said, how do I feel about that? I feel like for, to, for me to live is gain, and, or excuse me, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. One way or the other, I'm, I'm ahead of the game. I say, it don't matter to me no way. If I live, I'm going to keep preaching. If I die, I'm going to glory. I said, one way or the other, honey, I've won the race. It don't matter to me no way. Well, of course, you know these people looking at me like I've lost my mind. <laughs> After a couple of hours, one of those students, one of those seven or eight students, came back to my room. And he sat down next to me and he said, do you mind if I talk to you for a little while? I said, sure. He said, we've talked to a lot of patients who were dying and who were as sick as you are. And their life is hanging on a string and we don't really know if they're going to make it or not. He said, you are the first person we've ever talked to that responded the way you responded. He said, can you please tell me how in the world can you feel as positive and as up, you know, looking upward as you are? He said, how is that even possible? I looked at him. I was only, I was 34, turning 35 that September. And I looked at that fellow and I said, son, I'm going to tell you something. I preach Jesus. I preach Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary lived a sinless life, performed miracles as a sign of his divinity, died on the cross of Calvary, buried in a tomb, physically risen from the dead, glorified, hallelujah. I said, let me tell you, he has ascended to the right hand of the throne of God, and one day he's coming back for the church, and I've got heaven to look forward to. I said, I preach this message. I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. I don't preach this message for money. I don't preach this message for fame. I don't preach this message for celebrity. I preach this message because I believe it. Amen. Every word of it. Yes. Said, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't preach it. But I believe it. I said, so you know what? I said, so far as I believe, when you close your eyes in this life, you open them in God's great heaven. Hallelujah. I said, I've got family that have gone on before me. I believe when my great-grandmother closed her eyes in this world, she opened them in God's world. I believe when my great-aunt Geneva closed her eyes in this world, she opened them in God's world. I don't believe they're dead. I don't believe they're gone. I don't believe they no longer exist. I believe they're dancing and shouting and rejoicing around the throne of God and celebrating the salvation that Jesus Christ provided for them on the cross of Calvary. That's what I believe. That kid sat and talked to me for like two hours. Finally, at one point, he said, well, I guess I really need to go. I said, I'm sorry, y'all know I'm a talker, so it's no surprise to you that I could keep him there a while. And he said, I guess I need to go. I said, I'm sorry. I probably have kept you longer than I should have. He said, no. He said, I was off shift over an hour ago. But he sat there and he listened to me. I don't know what happened with that young man. I don't know where he's at today. I don't know if he ever came to the Lord because of the testimony. But I'll tell you this much I know. He knows that faith can be real. 
He knows that people can walk straight into the valley of the shadow of death and have a smile on their face and joy in their heart and not be filled with fear and terror. He knows that. Amen. See, I don't know, Johnny, I don't know what God's bigger plan is. I don't understand some of the roads that God has us take. But I do know this. He's working a bigger plan than I can ever imagine. And if I box God in with my anticipation, well, but the Word of God teaches it's God's will to heal. Yes, it does. And He will. But don't put Him in a box. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't think you know how he's going to do it. Don't think you know when he's going to do it. Don't think you know why he's going to do it. Just let God be God. Submit yourselves. The Word of God, I talk about this the last couple of weeks many times. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Give your body, understand that your body is going through a sacrificial time. Your body is being sacrificed for that moment. But God has something he's trying to do that's bigger than you could ever imagine. Let God work his perfect plan. But don't stop believing for the miracle. Don't stop expecting the miracle. Just don't box God in with your anticipation. Oh, I hope you understand what I'm telling you today. Don't box God in with your ideas of how, where, when He's going to accomplish His perfect work. Expect your blessing, your miracle, your healing to come. But do not try to anticipate the way in which it will come. When things don't come from the direction or in the way we anticipate they will come, we often give up hope and stop looking for them to come at all. If you're on a deserted island and you say, well, you know, uh, my understanding is that Ships, you know, go through a shipping lane to the east here. So I'm going to stay on the eastern side of the island and I anticipate that a ship will eventually come by and maybe I can signal and I can catch that ship. You might have been smarter to get in the middle of the island up on a hill somewhere. Hello now. Might have been smarter to get on the highest mountain you could get on and light your fire. That way, whether a ship is coming on this side of the island or whether a ship is coming on that side of the island or whether a ship is coming from the north, the south, the east, or the west, either way, they're going to see your fire. But if all you do is anticipate your ship coming from the east and everything you do is in preparation for the ship coming from the east, do you follow what I'm telling you now? You done cut yourself off from three avenues of blessing. You've cut yourself off from three avenues of rescue. Am I telling the truth today? I lived in New York City for a number of years. I used to ride the bus. I used to ride the subway. Well, you get to riding the bus and you get to riding the subway. You get to the point where you anticipate what you expect the bus to look like. You anticipate what you expect the subway to look like. Am I telling the truth? You know what I'm talking about. You go out and wait on a bus. You're not sitting there without some idea of what that bus is going to look like. But you know what? If a bus pulls up and it's a completely different color and if it's all wrapped up in advertising and it don't look like the other bus that just went by uh, 30 minutes ago, I'm not going to let that bus go by me just because it don't look like the bus I had in my mind. Are you hearing what I'm telling you now? No. you got to be willing to accept what comes. you got to be willing to recognize that what you're waiting on is what's showing up when it gets there. Hello now. 
and not to be sinners. I can just see somebody sitting there saying, nope, that bus don't look like the other buses, so I'm just going to sit here and wait until the bus comes, looks like the other buses. Boy, you're going to be waiting a while. But a lot of people do that when it comes to God. A lot of people do that when it comes to miracles. They have an idea in their mind like Naaman, how the miracle is supposed to come about. And if it doesn't come about the way that they anticipate it will come about, then they walk away ready, mad as a hornet, and they just give up on the whole notion. Thank God for somebody that ran up behind him and said, Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Master. If, if that old prophet had come down and he told you, you know, go slay this nation or that nation, if he told you to go... Uh, you know, kill a bear in the woods or kill a lion out in the middle of the wilderness somewhere, some great feat. He said, you wouldn't have thought anything in the world about doing that, would you? See, because you think a lot of yourself. <laughs> you see yourself as being very capable. What you didn't want to do is humble yourself and get in a muddy river and dip yourself seven times. I'm going to tell you, that's another reason a lot of people don't get their miracle, because they don't want to humble themselves. Mm -hmm. And when God gives them a direction, they don't want to follow God's direction. Because it requires that they do something that is, pardon me, but it's beneath me. Mm -hmm. That's beneath me. I ain't going to go to that little church over there. What are you, crazy? That's beneath me. When there's great big old cathedral of hope over here with this big pretty building and with this big beautiful organ and with all the accoutrements and with a choir and with musicians, why in the world, God, would I go to that little old church over there? Well, might be because he told you to. Mm -hmm. You might find your healings here if you'd get here. You might find your answers are here if you'd get here. You might find that you would reconcile some issues you've been struggling with if you'd get here like he told you to get here. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I'm going to tell you, my great aunt many years ago, my great aunt Geneva uh, had a stomach cancer, and the stomach cancer had literally eaten through the wall of her stomach. She had a gaping hole in the wall of her stomach. She had to put, this is way back, this is probably back in the 50s or 60s, she had to take diapers, uh, cloth diapers, and fold them up. She would put them on there, and they would tie a belt around her waist, and that was, those diapers were the only thing keeping her insides in. The doctors told her at that time there was nothing more they could do. It was a matter of time, and she would be leaving this world. Her sisters, they were a close family. My grandfather and his sisters and brothers, they, they were a close-knit bunch. One day, my Aunt Eleanor was visiting Geneva. And they were sitting there and they're talking. And all of a sudden, it dawned on my Aunt Eleanor. said, wait a minute, you know what? You're talking like a dying woman. You're talking like somebody who's getting ready to die. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're Pentecostal women. We're Holy Ghost filled women. We're women that believe that God's a miracle working God. What in the world are we doing sitting here talking about dying when our God is a healer? She said, Geneva, there's a little Pentecostal church just right across the street from you, not very far from here. They had never walked into it. They had never visited it. They had never been in it. They attended another church, but there was a Pentecostal church. It was a Wednesday night they were having service. She said, why don't we go over there and get them people to anoint you with oil and pray for you, and let's just expect a miracle. Aunt Geneva pulled herself together, pulled an old dress, house dress on over those diapers. They went across to that little church. That little church had never seen these women, didn't know these women. My aunt Eleanor got up and told them what they had come for. They set her down, Aunt Geneva, they set her down on their altar at the front, the prayer altar. And then people in that little church got, the little church, this wasn't a Benny Hinn meeting. 
This wasn't an Oral Roberts meeting. See what I told you? Oh, honey, don't put God in a box about how he's going to do things. Don't you think? I'm going to tell you, Tammy Faye, when she had cancer, God forgive me. I love Tammy Faye, but when she had cancer, she went to see Benny Hinn. Well, guess what? She still died with her cancer. She might have done better if she'd have gone some little tiny Pentecostal church somewhere that she'd never been to, that had never seen her, that, it, that she had never seen. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? But you see, you anticipate, oh, I know I can get what I need from Benny Hinn. I know Benny Hinn can touch God. <laughs> Aunt Geneva got prayed for in that service. She went home. Still had a big gaping hole in her side. She still had to change the diapers every couple of hours because they would soak through with pus and blood and what have you. Went to sleep that night, and guess what? The next morning she woke up, and there was no hole in her side. It had completely healed overnight, overnight, while she was sleeping. She called her doctor. She told her doctor, she said, Doctor, I've got to tell you, I've been healed. I went last night to a little church across the street from me, and I've been healed. And the doctor told her later that he thought she'd lost her mind. He thought that her dying had finally caught up with her, you know, and she'd kind of fallen off the rocker. And he said, well, if you've been healed, then why don't you come into my office and let me see? He told her later, he said, I was getting ready to admit you because I figured, you know, we were going to have to keep a real close eye on you for your last few moments. Her husband was at work. She didn't have a ride, so she walked three miles to her doctor's office. This, I know this story firsthand from my great aunt. She walked three miles to her doctor's office. She went in that office. She didn't have a big old pad of diapers stuck on her belly. The doctor lifted up her dress and looked, and there she was, skin like a baby, brand new. God had given her a miracle overnight. Oh, I'm going to tell you, she could have missed that miracle if she'd have had it in her mind how that miracle was going to come or who that miracle was going to come through. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Or when that miracle was going to come. Don't put God in a box. Don't anticipate. Expect. Expect the miracle. But don't anticipate how God is going to or when God is going to bring that miracle to you. In the book of Acts chapter 3 verses 1 through 8. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us! And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Expecting to receive something of them. Are you hearing me today? Are you listening? Call? Expecting to receive some. Thing of them. He did not anticipate they were going to give them a shekel. He did not anticipate they were going to give them a penny. He did not anticipate they were going to give them a five dollar bill. If I were stopped at a stoplight and somebody was on the corner looking for money and I kind of wave at him and indicate for him to come over to the car, he's going to come over with expectation. Am I telling the truth? But he's not going to anticipate what I'm going to give him because he doesn't know. I might give him a dollar. I might give him some change. I might give him a, a banana I have in the car. He doesn't know what I'm going to give him. But he knows I'm going to give him something. Do you hear what I'm telling you? That is what happened with this man. He expected to receive something of them. 
Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. If there's anything people love to hear when they're begging money is for you to tell them you're broke too. That's what Peter did. He said, I'm sorry, buddy, but I'm broke too. Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. There's an example of the need to expect but not to anticipate. Hello now. Am I telling the truth? You need to expect your miracle, but don't have to. You don't know what. Now, he didn't know what Peter and John were going to give him. He just knew Peter and John were going to give him something. Hello now. You don't know what God's going to do. You don't know when God's going to do it. You don't know how God's going to do it. But you know God's going to do it. Hallelujah. You know God's going to do it. Why? Because He's promised He would. And you can take God at His word. In the word of God, I'm closing today. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. If, it, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. In other words, once he gives it, he don't take it back. And it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So what's, what's James telling us? He says, you got to expect it. If you ask for it, God's ex he's looking for you to be expecting it to come. And you can't expect it one minute and not expect it the next minute. This is one reason why uh, Sister Cynthia this week, I sent her some songs, uh, videos on YouTube of some songs on YouTube that would encourage her faith and would build her faith up. The answer's on the way. This I know. Jesus said it. I believe it. And it's so. And some other songs. Because what you want to do, if you're going to keep your expectation up, then all you got to do is, is fill your ears and fill your spirit with uh, words and music and preaching that is going to keep you in a state of expectation. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? You want to encourage yourself to keep expecting a miracle. You want to encourage yourself to keep expecting, to keep that expectation. Amen. A woman gets pregnant, she don't expect a baby the first month and not expect it the second. No, she knows she's pregnant. She knows, well, I got news for you. I, I'm expecting this baby. I remember when I was a kid, that was the term they used. Nowadays, I don't know what all they say. But back in the day, the ladies that were, you know, had babies in them would say, well, I'm expecting. You're expecting what? An alien from outer space to catch you? With what? You're, what are you expecting? I'm expecting a baby. I'm expecting a child. Oh, okay. But you know what? Once you know you're impregnated, then you can expect that baby until the baby comes because nothing's going to change. <laughs> it's not like you're, you know, you're going to have less expectation the closer you get to the coming of the baby. No, you have more expectation the closer am I telling the truth. So what happens is it's important for believers that we do everything in our power to feed our expectation. Keep your faith charged up. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, sing the promises of God. Sing the word of God. Play songs that encourage your faith. And I want to tell you something. It works. It works. The anticipation is killing me. You want to lose out on your miracle? You want to wind up dead when you could have had a miracle? 
Just keep anticipating how God's going to do it, why God's going to do it, where God's going to do it, when God's going to do it. Keep trying to put God in your little box of anticipation. And I guarantee you, you'll wind up in a box yourself. Don't anticipate. Expect. There you go. Hallelujah. Expectation won't kill you, but anticipation will. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise God. Amen.